Holmes does not think that Lestrade is a very good detective, but he is always polite to him. He's often helped Lestrade with cases which have puzzled the Scotland Yard detective. Lestrade, will you be kind enough to let Mr McFarlane finish his story before you take him away? Holmes asked. Half an hour is all we ask. Well, you've helped me in the past, Mr Holmes, the policeman replied. I'd like to help you now. I'll give you half an hour. But it won't help Mr McFarlane, you know. The evidence against him is very strong. He'll soon be on trial for murder. And you know what happens to murderers, Mr Holmes? They are executed. Lestrade always reminded me of a bulldog. He was short and ugly. And he was always ready for a fight. But now he sat down. He had decided to listen to the young lawyer's story. Yesterday afternoon, I had a visitor at my office near London Bridge Station, McFarlane began. The man arrived at about three o'clock. I'd never seen him before. He told me that his name was Jonas Oldacre and that he wanted me to write his will for him. He took from his pocket some pieces of paper on which he had written a draft of the will. He simply wanted me to write it out again in the correct legal way. I read through his draft. It wasn't easy because his writing was very hard to read, the young man went on. But when I'd finished reading, I was very surprised. Mr. Oldacre wanted to leave all his money and everything he owned to me. Of course, I asked him why he wanted to do that. He didn't know me and I didn't know him. He told me that he knew my parents many years ago. And although he no longer saw them, he wanted to please them. He asked people who knew me if I was an honest man. He'd heard good things about me and he had no family of his own, so he thought that I should have his money after his death. What an interesting story, said Holmes. Did you agree to write the will? There was no reason for me to refuse, McFarlane replied. I thought that I was a very lucky man. Mr Oldacre asked me to write the will straight away. He signed it, and one of the clerks in my office was the witness, and signed it too. He then asked me to visit him at his house in Norwood. He told me that he needed to show me some documents, and he asked me to come after nine o'clock last night. He also asked me not to tell my parents about the will yet. He wanted it to be a surprise for them. Have you got any proof of your story, Mr McFarlane? Holmes asked. The signed will is at my office, but I'll show you Mr Oldacre's draft, McFarlane said. He took some pieces of paper from his pocket and gave them to Holmes. Holmes read them quickly and gave them to Lestrade. I agree with you about the writing. It is difficult to read, Holmes told the young lawyer. The draft was obviously written on a train. In two places, the writing is clear. I guess that those parts were written in stations when the train wasn't moving. Then there are places where the writing is worse. It's very bad indeed. Those parts were written when the train was crossing lots of points which were close together. Then Holmes turned to the inspector. Well, what can we say about this draft, Lestrade? He went on. It's obviously written on a train which only stopped twice during the writer's journey. And you only find lots of points close together near the main London stations. So, the draft was written on an express train between Norwood and London Bridge Station, which is near this young man's office. So we can say that Mr Oldacre didn't think about his will until he was travelling to Mr McFarlane's office. That's very clever, Mr Holmes, Lestrade said. But it doesn't change the evidence against Mr McFarlane. Well, please continue, Mr McFarlane, said Holmes. When Mr Oldacre had left my office, the young man said, I sent a telegram to my parents in Blackheath. I told them that I was going to meet a client and I was going to get home very late. I didn't tell them who my client was. Then, in the evening, I went to Norwood and I arrived at Mr Oldacre's house at about half past nine. The old housekeeper opened the door to me, he went on. 
Mr. Oldacre greeted me and gave me some food. Then he took me into his bedroom because he wanted to talk about some business documents. They were in his safe, which was open. We talked about the documents for a long time and I helped my clients seal some of them into envelopes with wax seals. After our meeting, I couldn't find my walking stick, but Mr. Oldacre said, You'll soon be here again, my young friend. I'll find it and keep it for you. When I left the house, he was alive and well. It was nearly midnight by then. It was too late for me to get to Blackheath, so I stayed in a hotel in Norwood. This morning, I saw the newspapers and I read about the disappearance. As I told you, Mr. Holmes, I came straight here. And now you must come with us, Mr. McFarlane, said Lestrade. My men will take you to Scotland Yard. I shall return to Norwood and continue my investigation. But we already know what happened, don't we? You found out that Mr. Oldacre was going to leave you his money and you couldn't wait for him to die. You killed him and tried to burn his body. You're wrong, said the young man, and Mr. Holmes will prove it. When McFarlane had left the house with Lestrade's two policemen, Holmes spoke to the inspector. I shall probably come to Norwood myself later in the day, he said, but I think I shall go to Blackheath first. Will you? Well, you must do what you want to do, Mr. Holmes, Lestrade said. But I think that you're wasting your time on this case. McFarlane is guilty. It's obvious. He sounded sure about it, but I could tell that he wanted to know what was in Holmes's mind, and Holmes was not going to tell him.